Ed, I would like to hand over to Rose, who will introduce the speaker for, for today. So Cheyenne Flores is the Climate Resiliency Fellow for the Philadelphia Office of Sustainability. She coordinates the implementation of the neighborhood-based heat resiliency plan, Beat the Heat Huntington Park, the Community Heat Relief Plan, and works on climate resiliency and equity initiatives in the office. All right, thanks, Rose. I, Cheyenne, I will make you a host right now. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, just bear with me while I get my screen up and running. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, if I sound winded, I apologize. <laughs> Community organizing is certainly a hurdle. Um, and today I was up doing things in Hunting Park until about 3.50. So <laughs> just bear with me um, and I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay, yes, yeah, so as has been mentioned perhaps too many times now, I'm Cheyenne. Um, I am with the city's Office of Sustainability um, and I work in partnership with um, Esperanza, which is a local nonprofit in Hunting Park. Um, Hunting Park is a neighborhood in North Philadelphia. Um, and we created a plan with residents, organizations, um, namely Esperanza and the city, um, to try to begin to address the heat disparity in the city, which I will talk about now. Oh, it doesn't let me click on the arrows. Okay. Um, so let's say the main um, and continual impetus for this work is... Um, is responding to climate change. So, um, you know, what that looks like obviously looks uh, different in, in all spectrums and in all situations, each neighborhood being extremely unique um, and requiring tailored um, response. So we decided to do a pilot program um, recognizing extreme heat as a, a top top concern in Philadelphia. Um, Philadelphia is on the East Coast. We are um, set to have many, many hotter days, um, much more rain. So we have been seeing it uh, pretty uh, consistently that it's sort of becoming more and more of a little rainforest here, um, specifically in southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, we're close to the water. And so we know that it's hot. So I included this little graphic here, which is actually just from um, two weeks ago. We had a heat health emergency, um, which is when the heat index rises above, I believe, 102 for a series of days. Um, so you can see it was really hot at 7 a.m. It was already 80 degrees. Um, so this was the impetus of our project. Um, so it really began with heat mapping, um, and that was probably the main way that we identified hot spots in the city. Um, so the heat mapping was done by Arizona State University. Um, David Hondala was a big partner on the work. Um, and then again, by a fellow in the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. Uh, so that is our, our kind of older heat mapping and that is what you will find in the Beat the Heat plan. Um, but we were really lucky and had a new uh, version created by NASA but it's not yet public, so I wasn't going to share it today. Um, but it's a little bit more refined and a little bit has a little bit more information. So we know that by this heat mapping, we learned that some neighborhoods are 22 degrees hotter than other neighborhoods at any given time. Um, and this has nothing to do with, you know, where the sun is or anything like that, where clouds happen to be sitting. It has much more to do with things like policy um, and things like racism. Um, and what went into the heat mapping is obviously surface data, surface temperature data, um, population, um, age, uh, socioeconomic demographics, ethnicity, social, social isolation. Um, so the percent of the population, like over 65, who lives alone. Um, and these types of things helped us uh, quantify the vulnerability. So the main um, 
background I always give with the project and that you will also find in the plan talks a little bit about climate change, right? And everyone on this call understands climate change and um, you know, knows that I will say loud and clear here that it is real um, and that it is a real issue that we are dealing with today and have been dealing with and will continue to be dealing with. Um, so for Philadelphia, the specifics of this, um, just some like stark information I, I like to share widely is the fact that we know that the temperature is gradually going up um, from our Growing Stronger uh, report. Um, we have this graphic on the right uh, showing us that. And then um, last summer, which we don't have as much information about this summer, but last summer, um, it was the hottest across the globe, right? Um, and that, you know, Philly was not separate from that. Um, we had historically about like seven days above 95 degrees. We are projected to have 52 days above 95 degrees by the end of the century. And that's probably, um, a, a conservative um, projection. So given that, um, we launched a pilot. Um, so the pilot's being called Beat the Heat Hunting Park, a community heat relief plan designed to be an, indeed packaged into a plan, um, something readable, deliverable, but also designed to be an ongoing project that eventually left the city's hands and was put into the, the neighborhood and community's hands, which is where we are at now, which I'll share at the end. Um, so actually this logo here was created by uh, community members um, at one of the many events that was held. So I, I really like that. Um, and on the right hand side, you can just see a little bit of a um, tidbit of some of the engagement materials one being a mapping exercise where folks showed us where they go to stay cool um, and also helped us identify the boundaries of their neighborhood because um, Philadelphia is the city of neighborhoods. And I think in most cities also uh, boundaries of neighborhoods are, are often contested. Um, and so sometimes the city or other organizations try to come in and tell the residents where the boundaries are. Um, and so I think we try to flip the script, script and hear from the residents where the boundaries are. Um, and so that it's, it's one iteration. Um, and I think some, some residents still now are like, no, this goes a little further down. Um, but that's sort of where that came from. Partners on the project include Hunting Park United, um, North 10, Philadelphia, obviously I said the city, Esperanza, Lenfa Center is part of North 10, um, and the Community Revitalization Corporation. So I just first want to start with talking about like how and why we integrated um, equity into this project. Um, and I would say it's, it's pretty well captured in this, in this graphic here. Um, and these are our guiding principles now and they were in the beginning in 2018 when the plan was being developed. Um, I would say that the first and loudest being what's at top, voicing needs. Um, so um, what are the what are the actual needs of the participants of those who took part in creating the project, um, and how do we make sure everyone's needs are met and heard? Um, so I'd say one of the biggest things in that would be translation. Um, there was a lot of effort put towards translation through the project. Um, acknowledging community history and identity was hugely hugely important, and I think that's a huge component in um, building trust in in any realm, um, but specifically. Specifically, Hunting Park, they have a long-standing history, which I'll also talk about, of um, mistrust with the government and also um, advocacy. So it's, it's an interesting um, dynamic there. And um, it, being that many times when we talk about environmental stressors or environmental harms, it's easy to frame the problem um, as if all there is in this community, neighborhood, group, whatever it is, is a problem. Um, but I think part of the Beat the Heat plan that's really important for us is to always acknowledge what incredible uh, strides have been made within the community itself, by the community itself, and also what are the wonderful things that are there and continue to be there, not just what's the bad. Um, so they're really, the residents there are really leaders um, and advocates for the environment and themselves. Um, and I would say that we really learn more from them than they learn from us being the sort of quote unquote experts. Um, so I'd say again, with that expert, shifting power is hugely important. Um, so recognizing where power shows up in the dynamic of sort of a top-down approach um, is the first step, I think, in, in flipping top-down to grassroots. Um, 
uh, acknowledging one's own privilege and power and also the organization's privilege and power. Um, working to shift power can be done by things like making sure residents that are really active are compensated, making sure that um, decision making is is included in all steps of the process with everyone's input being actively um, input it into the project. Um, also creating leadership again is also really important and I would say the main way that we did that was by compensating residents so that they th then could really focus on the project um, and be able to you know make a living while doing it. Um, so using storytelling as data is probably my favorite. Um, so being that the biggest piece of information that led the project was the survey, I would say that's kind of how we did that. And then also um, having community events where folks were heard, um, listened to, and um, having things like mapping exercises where folks could give input and um, actively create. Um, relationship building obviously is, is important as well. Uh, I would say that we have a pretty wonderful relationship. I came on last year um, and it was at that time that I had sort of not taken over for someone else, but um, been sort of inserted into the project and someone else had left. Um, Sophie Sakar was the woman who uh, initially led this project. Um, so it was it was a difficult transition to make sure that, you know, I built relationships. Um, but you know, putting in the time, showing up for things that don't necessarily benefit your project itself, I think were really important parts of that. So what is Hunting Park? How did we choose it? Um, like I said, it's a neighborhood in North Philadelphia. For those of you who are not familiar with Philadelphia, North Philadelphia has a pretty um, stark history of disinvestment from the government. Um, it was a survivor of some pretty nefarious policies such as redlining, which I'll dive into a little bit more later. Um, so we know that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of push in North Philly for um, more, more concentration and effort to be applied there for things like putting trees in um, and, and working with community members. So Hunting Park is really culturally diverse. It's beautiful. Um, it has a gigantic park um, in the middle of it. It is 47% Spanish speaking. It's quite young community. 39% of the population is under the age of 18. Um, with that, it was, I would also say that being there, you might not know that it's young just because there's a lot of long-term residents who do a lot and you'll see a lot and there's a whole host of community organizers in this neighborhood in particular. Um, as I mentioned, they have a long-standing history of environmental justice advocacy. Uh, the prevention of the toxic industry expansion was really big. Um, they revitalized an 87 acre park that I mentioned is in the middle of the neighborhood um, and have planted over 800 trees and that number is growing, growing all the time. Um, Esperanza really leads on that tree planting, but um, residents without a community org behind them have also planted a lot of trees. Um, and that would be in partnership with two programs that we have in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Horticultural Society and Tree Philly. So there's also a significant presence of industry. There was a lot of industry um, pre-World War II, a little bit post-World War II. Um, and then, you know, with things being moved and white flight, a lot of industry left the area, but the warehouses, the um, infrastructure did not leave and it just kind of became dilapidated. Um, so there's an aging housing stock in general as well uh, with darker rooftops and more hardscape. There's lack of trees and green space. Um, there was a lot of trees and green space, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we had three big organizations working behind us, uh, with us, Esperanza, Hunting Park United, and North 10 um, are all very large organizations who um, have a lot of support behind them and were able to help um, and had capacity to take part in the project. Um, okay, so the first and most important, I think, part of the project was background research. Um, and this is kind of like step one um, of our of our toolkit that we created. So um, identifying the policies that were crafted by racist and discriminatory practices is crucial. Um, and we learn, you know, we learn that we practice it. Um, we constantly talk about it. So as I mentioned, World War II um, brought like a interesting amount of jobs and investment in a lot of parts of Philadelphia. Um, and 
it created a, a big divide between white and black workers and a lot of black workers were held back um, from actually being able to get a job um, and were uh, systematically kind of pushed into North Philadelphia. Another factor to um, incorporate is that, um, of course, we understand that racial discrimination is very real, very real. Um, we know that people of color are more likely to report being racially discriminated against, especially during housing. So housing is an important um, concept here with this project um, in general, I think. And then, of course, I would be remiss if I did not um, include information about, obviously, we have serious discrimination, racial profiling that goes down within the city, within the country, um, and the, the uh, racial movement and revolution happening now, I think, is a uh, long time coming and has been something that has been pu being pushed and led by Philadelphia for a long time, um, but we are not exempt from the effects of it. So, um, with that, I mentioned tree canopy. Um, so I have one resident who told me that um, she used to walk through the neighborhood and it would be downpouring and she wouldn't need an umbrella because there were that many trees and they were that dense. Um, so that's just like a, a good tidbit, I think, to, to let you understand that it's not that there weren't trees there, it's that they were taken down. Um, a lot of times to fix the sidewalk, um, to build more houses, to put piping in, um, and, and they often were not put back. The sidewalk was not renovated after the fact. Um, so, you know, again, a, a real history of, of disinvestment. Um, so tree canopy is a big part of, you know, why is this neighborhood so hot? lack of tree canopy and green space. So industry, as I mentioned, is another one. This is a aerial footage of um, Hunting Park and all of the larger, actually ironically white roofed um, buildings are um, industry. And then the one that's um, marked with a, a marker, Richard S. Burns, that is a recycling plant. Um, and we have yet to incorporate that into our plan, but I know many of the residents are very, very worried about that and do feel that it creates a lot of extra heat. Um, and as we know, industry in general creates heat. Um, oops, sorry. And then dark roofs and surfaces. So a lot of the houses are older and therefore they don't have the new rule that we have in Philly, which newer excuse me, houses are meant to have white roofs on top. Um, and then also with that older nature of the houses, they are also not weatherized. So a lot of heat and cold, but since we're focusing on heat right now, um, gets in the house, it's hard to keep a seat or heating in the house. Um, mold is a, is a big issue. We, we, we have a very humid, very, very humid climate in Pennsylvania. Um, and so this contributes to a, a hotter, a hotter um, neighborhood driven by policy. Um, and again, land use and zoning here, we have land cover. So we know that um, the zoning for the North District um, is, is pretty industrial. We have here, it's an industrial area, industrial area. Um, and so, you know, we know that the, the general North Philadelphia District has a lot of industry, old and present. Um, and then in terms of land cover, tree, tree canopy, buildings and hardscape, uh, Hunting Park has 5% tree canopy compared to 18% in the whole city. Um, and then 85% hardscape and um, buildings compared to 51 in the city. So it obviously is an outlier in terms of those um, factors. So here I like to include this. Um, I, I notice kids really respond to this comparison um, who either live in the neighborhood or do not. Um, you can see a very clear difference here between these two photos. And it's not to say that the one on the left is better. It's just to say that it clearly was created to house trees and green space. It has space on the sidewalk. It has trees that are not devouring the sidewalk, which is a concern for many folks. It has green space that it has been allotted space in front of a home. Homes are separated and not necessarily connected and put together. Um, so just some of these factors that go in, again, making a hotter neighborhood, again, driven by policy. So um, discriminatory practices, we all know this is very real, extremely real. Um, and the one that we uh, emphasize the most, I, I like to emphasize the most, would be redlining, although there are several others, um, racial covenants put in by the FHA, like I said, toxic waste siting, um, affordable housing siting, 
all those factors. But redlining, um, I think, is, is a, a good example of a sort of how policy works and how it continues to work into the um, system of uh, systematic racism. So on the left, we have the Philadelphia um, Hulk redlining map. Um, and I, I include this in, in a lot of our flyers and information and tabling and any time I really talk with a resident um, of any neighborhood. And as we know, redlining is when black and brown communities specifically, but also just non-white communities um, are systematically denied services provided by the federal and local government and the private sector. Um, so here we have red areas that indicate hazardous spaces based on the um, black and brown communities who are living there. Um, so it's just, it couldn't be more obvious with things like this. And we are lucky that we do have our Philadelphia redlining map. I know some other cities um, have gone missing. Um, so I'm, I'm sad that it's existing, but I'm happy that we have it here to um, continue to fight against it and also um, show how, how systematic racism runs. Um, so yeah, racial inequity um, and heat exposure is, is a huge part of um, how heat makes its way into cities and neighborhoods in particular. Um, and also it affected hugely where people live. So with that, the heat resiliency pilot um, again, so number one was background research, which I like to emphasize. Um, number two would be the Hunting Park Heat Team. Um, so the Heat Team was created um, with many, many partners, 30 partners, um, including, like I said, organizational partners and also residents. Um, and so we have a number of residents pictured here. And I actually don't think actually in this picture, any organizations are pictured here. Um, and they met bi-weekly throughout the summer. Uh, right now, we have a little bit of a different schedule that I'll talk about in a second. And then number three would be the Beat the Heat kickoff, which is a very fun, basically, block party, um, where, as you can see, the kids there are making the Beat the Heat logo. Um, and it's a series of block parties with art and cooling resources, ice cream, water ice, things like that. Again, relationship building, trust building, making events, they're fun. Um, for number four is um, the Beat the Heat Ambassador. So this is what I was talking about with compensated roles um, and the importance of paying people to do the work. If you're going to ask them for labor, they need to be paid. Um, something that we're really emphasizing now is also paying, well, I shouldn't say now, have been, um, is paying folks particularly for translation services. Um, you know, it's an extra burden and it, it should be compensated. Um, so we recruited and invested in a uh, resident Beat the Heat team leader, um, picture there, Jose Veran, and then um, they trained multiple uh, heat ambassadors to help take surveys, staff, event tables, um, reach out to folks, help give out resources. Um, and again, this year we have a similar structure um, that I'll talk about in a in a bit. Um, and then the Hunting Park Heat Survey, again, we have that this year as well. We did not do it last year in 2019. Um, and with this collaboration, the University of Pennsylvania really helped us. Um, and the Heat Survey asks questions like, um, are you ever too hot in your home when it's hot outside? Do you have air conditioning? Um, do you like to leave your house or stay in your house when it's hot outside? Things like that. It also asks about knowledge of resources like the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, Tree Philly, things of that nature, cooling centers. Surprisingly, a lot of people don't know what cooling centers are. Um, and then it also was sort of catered to um, something that I'll talk about in a second, the Heat Relief Network, which is trying to create a space for people to go when it's hot um, and ask questions around that. Um, so I'll share all the, all the uh, survey information in a second. And then the Beat the Heat mobile station um, was really just kind of something that moved around at different locations that had information about Beat the Heat, had activities around heat beating the heat, um, and also had uh, opportunities to fill out surveys and get involved. Um, I think it really catered to kids at a couple events and then um, adults at, at different events. Um, so seven would be the design workshop. Like I said, it's sort of a mapping workshop. Um, so re 40 residents were a part of this and they um, helped identify cooling interventions that they wanted to see in their neighborhood, like tree plantings, cool roofs, cooling spaces, bus shelters, et cetera, um, and helped us mark where those would go. Um, and then the environmental wellness fair and tree giveaway was a really wonderful event. Um, 
and it it offered um, environmental jobs. It offered events, games, food, music, um, and also talked about all the offerings of the different programs that were involved. So Sierra Club, um, Esperanza, and Tree Philly. Um, and then the Heat Relief Network. So there were meetings that took place in 2018 with Beat the Heat Development um, to help identify faith leaders that were interested in being part of the um, Beat the Heat Network. And also um, what were the existing assets and resources available in the neighborhood to help create something like this. Um, and it continued into this summer. So this summer was uh, the first implementation and that is where I'll talk about Heat Relief Network more. Um, and then stakeholder interviews last. So um, they interviewed 10 Keyhole stakeholders and residents about their experiences with heat in the neighborhood um, and kind of what they learned through Beat the Heat, if it was helpful to them um, and what cooling solutions, again, they wanted to see in their neighborhood. So constantly trying to sort of pull those, those, uh, that feedback about what, what folks wanna see in their neighborhood. Um, so the heat survey. So I would say the survey is sort of like the compass of the project. Um, it, it helps me specifically right now. Um, and I would say anyone who wants to know about the project know why we are doing this project. So there was a question that um, Justine and Sebastian had talked to me about, about um, assumptions that went into this project. And I would say here, there are big assumptions. So when we found out that some neighborhoods are 22 degrees hotter than others, when we found out that Philadelphia is getting hotter and hotter, there's the assumption that residents, folks that live here, uh, including those who work for organizations or those who um, have a, a external job, that that would be something that folks worry about and are concerned over. That is an assumption not everyone feels that way right so the storytelling data in the um, form of relationship building events chatting with people and the heat survey which is a more formalized uh, version of collecting storytelling and turning it into data told us if that was actually accurate do folks care um, and i will say resounding yes that folks care um, so this is a map of um Hunting Park, and in the center, you can see the actual park of Hunting Park. Um, and these are all the areas that uh, people were surveyed. So, like I said, a majority of respondents think high heat is indeed very important. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our survey taking um, efforts this summer, but just to explain that that is still the way it is. It's actually almost the exact same number at this moment. We're not done surveying. It's about 82% right now. Um, and trash and dumping and vacant property were also very, very often mentioned. That's actually not the case this summer, however. Um, oh, sorry. And then most respondents, about 77%, reported always or sometimes feeling too hot inside their homes. So that's interesting. Um, people are too hot inside their homes because then we also found out um, that a lot of respondents need better access to AC and fans. Um, and a lot of people, 40% 40, 40 of respondents, noted that the cost of electricity is a barrier um, and, and comes in the way of being able to fully cool themselves with things like AC and fans. Um, and then even more interesting, a majority of respondents prefer to stay home despite the fact that 77% of respondents reported they're too hot in their homes. They still would rather stay home when it's hot out. Um, and then a larger population of Spanish speakers prefer to leave home for heat relief, which is interesting. Um, it speaks to the, um, the information that we know from actual research and then also from being a member of the Hispanic community and then also speaking with Hispanic community, that the Hispanic community, Spanish speaking community, Latinx, they are, they have an incredible um, tendency toward social cohesion. Um, so I think this speaks to that, that they, you know, reported being comfortable leaving their home, likely to go to a friend's or neighbor's family member's house um, to hang out and, and share at AC. So then we also know that 61% of respondents reported always using AC when it's very hot outside. So obviously we know, again, that's another assumption, which is why I say obviously, AC helps you cool down, right? Um, so it just helps us to, to solidify that. Um, and still 76% of respondents noted that better access to AC and fans would help them. Um, and then as I mentioned, the cost is still a barrier. 
And then the awareness of existing city programs is, is pretty low. Um, so the, the one that folks knew best was utility assistance, which I was happy to hear that um, at about 40%. And then similarly, cooling centers 40%. That um, is very different now. Actually, I would say that a lot of people know about Ready Philadelphia, which is basically like a system that texts your phone or email, whatever contact information the city has for you um, and tells you about like severe weather and things like that. That is like one of the highest right now. Cooling centers is pretty low. Utility assistance is also pretty high. So just an update of, of the current surveying that's going on. Um, and we are doing a lot toward utility assistance. I would say that's probably going to be like the next big push for part of our project. So, sorry, I can't even see what I wrote here. Okay, the survey results. So planning for the heat relief network. Um, so these particular questions were tailored to planning for the heat relief network. Um, so asking folks like, how do you get information in your community? And 49% said neighbors. Um, so that tells us a lot. Block captain or community leader, again, that's a neighbor. TV, radio, or newspaper, I think is really important. And we've learned that a lot. Um, putting things on the news helps a lot, but it can be, it's. It can be quite costly and, and difficult. Um, and then which of the following cooling interventions would you like to see more of in your neighborhood? And 60% said tree planting. And a lot of people said cool roofs, gardens and green space match the, matched it. So again, that would be an assumption, right? Why wouldn't want someone want trees, gardens and cool roofs? It's just a white roofing that goes on, helps, um, you know, reflect the light and heat as we all know. Um, What's interesting to note here is that tree planting is actually not as, so it's 60%, you know, it's not 100% and you might assume most people, why wouldn't everyone want a tree? So there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of um, mistrust around trees in the city for two different reasons. One is that folks feel that the trees, um, the roots disturb the um, water pipes, which is actually false. It's that when they're a, when a water pipe is already broken is when the root finds its way to the water. Otherwise, the root does not know there's water inside the pipe. Um, so you could still argue, well, it's still hurting the, the pipes, but that's because the pipe was already broken. Um, and then the other problem is, um, well, maybe there's three problems. One is that the um, sidewalk buckles, and that's because inappropriate trees were planted long ago. And now we know that and we plant trees that make sense to plant in these in these um, environment. But still it remains that many trees are too large and they rip up the sidewalk. And who does that fall on in Philadelphia? That falls on the resident. And then when trees fall or um, branches fall, again, it falls on the resident. Let's say it crushed your windshield, you're paying for that. Um, there are times when you can contact the city and help uh, try to get help um through through an avenue um but it's very backed up right like most things um and then another series of questions to help us inform the, the heat relief network which is which of the following activities might convince you to leave your home to stay cool um so a lot of people said swimming right everybody loves swimming and honey park in particular is um very partial to swimming they have a quite quite a large pool in the in the middle of the park with the rec center which this year was closed um so all pools will not all, but most pools were closed this summer in Philadelphia um, because of COVID-19 and social distancing. Um, spray pads were indeed open though, but there's no spray pad in Hunting Park and there's no cooling center. There's no cooling center in Hunting Park because there's no Hunting Park library. There is one kind of nearby, but um, it's a trek for some folks. Um, again, movie screening, games, sports, music, food, all things that people like, um, but swimming seemed to be the, the most important. Um, and then asking the question, like, where do you go if you leave your house when it's hot out? Um, and most people said pool. So less Spanish speakers said pool, but most people said pool. Um, and then spray ground was pretty high for, the, for Spanish speakers, but lower for English speakers. Um, friend or neighbor's home was at about 21%, which was a little bit surprising. And then the park for English speakers was quite high at 35%. Um, and the park is specific. Like, I think that's a question specific to Hunting Park because there's a giant park in the middle. So so another neighborhood, you might not necessarily ask that question. Um, so the survey findings um, were put into three different categories. So home cooling, cooling in public spaces, and trees and greening. Um, so home cooling would be how do we get energy efficient appliances? How do we get home repairs? Um, how do we make sure outreach is adequate and beyond adequate? so that people know about these things and these offerings and how to get them and how to sign up for them. I apologize, I know this is blurry, but it was more just for visual. Um, 
and then year-round light heap utility assistance. So we're really excited because this year we were able to kind of take part in the petitioning for getting uh, low-income home energy assistance program funds used for the summertime in Pennsylvania, believe it or not, even though it's quite hot here and it is a similar um, temperature to other states around us that have light heat in the summer, Pennsylvania does not have light heat funds available for AC slash fan slash any energy use in the summer. It is a winter program in Pennsylvania of the whole state um, and used for, for heating. So that's obviously uh, wrong. And our summers are getting hotter. Summer really is now, I would venture, summers are really May through like September. Even October is quite hot. Um, during the midday, it can get very, very warm these days and will just continue to get hotter um, as time goes on and climate change continues. So making sure that we have energy efficient uh, appliances, specifically ACE units, are, is obviously very important. However, we cannot say that some folks cannot get AC units and we can't help them get AC units because they give off emissions, because that is um, taking resources away from folks that already were barred from resources because we think it's better for the environment. So that's really, I think, the best example, um, and I would say heating is a similar one, as when like equity and climate change response can collide, um, being that you want to reduce GHG emissions, but you also need to respond to people's needs. And again, we have to level the playing field. If folks need things, they need to get them. They need to have access to them. Um, and the, uh, the um, need, I guess, to constantly police others and uh, specifically with like energy use is just, it's not, it's not an equitable practice. Um, so I just wanted to include that there. Um, so we were able to get crisis funds for LIHEAP for this summer, but we still need to work on getting it actually given year round. Um, so we're working on that. And then this summer we've done a fair amount with um, getting outreach to folks for LIHEAP. Uh, it closes on August 30th. 31st though. Um, so then uh, recommendations for staying cool in public spaces, the Hunting Bar Heat Relief Network, I'm going to talk about that more in a bit. Um, air conditioning in public schools, a lot of public schools in Philadelphia do not have air conditioning. Um, libraries do, recreation centers, some do, many don't. Um, cool and safe transportation, so we have a lot of bus shelters, uh, sorry, bus stops that do not have bus shelters, um, which is a shame and uh, transportation to things during heat health emergencies, we uh, argued should really be free. Um, and then obviously reducing exhaust, again, GHG emissions and the like uh, during, through transportation would be obviously shifting to um, electric vehicles in the city, which we have begun somewhat. Um, and then also with that, staying cool, seven all alone, uh, staying cool outdoors. So making sure that the park is really safe, having better lighting, making sure there's things there that help folks stay cool, water, shade structures, misting, um, and then extending the hours of the hunting park pool. So this is obviously pre-COVID stuff. Um, and then pop-up pool strategies are really interesting. And um, there was a push by the Knight Foundation, which funded part of this project back in 2018. Uh, to make a pop-up pool at hunting park. So it just brings in things, fun things like floaties, shade structures, ice cream, stuff like that. Um, and then trees and greening, the last set of recommendations. So tree plant plantings and care. Um, so getting more partners for tree filly yard tree giveaways. Right now, Espadanza is the biggest one in the area. Expanding bilingual tree tenders training. Espadanza had the first one in 2018. Then there was um, another one last February before COVID, I, I attended, um, targeting street tree plantings on the hottest blocks. There is a project right now with Esperanza um, called the Summer of Mapping with Azavia. Um, that's really exciting. That is that is prioritizing tree uh, treeing on, on certain blocks um, led by mapping. And then information about street trees in, available in Spanish and English. Um, neighborhood greening would be more gardens, uh, greening vacant lots, creating more space for gardens, um, more green stormwater infrastructure. The Philadelphia Water Department leads our Green City Clean Waters 
um, program, which is a green stormwater infrastructure initiative. It's wonderful. Um, and they are undertaking many, many projects in Honey Park. So that's exciting. Um, and then making sure that industrial sites and commercial sites have things like that. So there's a lot of SEPTA areas. There's a big supermarket called Cousin Supermarket that is a huge um, uh, parking lot. Um, and that it's very, very hot right there. Um, and then schools like McClure Elementary, they actually did add a series of trees after this. Um, and then Hunting Park Green Corps, which has not happened, which would be um, local job training for young adults in Hunting Park for um, community organizing and environmental resilience. So things like tree, tree maintenance and green space enhancement enhancement, heat outreach. So there are elements that um, have been undertaken through that, um, but the actual like initiative itself has not been. Um, so it might be uh, a new um, push after we finish. So um, this was all culminated into the Beat the Heat Toolkit, which is designed to help other groups replicate the process using those 10 steps um, and has tools for each. And then we are now in implementation. So um, I'm really- Cheyenne, Cheyenne sorry. sorry. Um, Sorry to interrupt. We only have about maybe 10 more minutes for discussion. Um, just, just wondering if we should slowly start wrapping up so we can kind of transition into, into our discussion with the group and answer any questions people have. Sure. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Time check noted. I was, I was also wondering that. Um, yeah, just going through the implementation, I'll, I'll run through it quickly. I think I have like two or three slides left. This is the first stage, just a graphic of like some of the things that we that we share with folks. Um, and the big push this summer was the Beat the Heat Heat Relief Network. So we got funds from the EPA, Esperanza and Pennsylvania Interfaith Power and Light partnered to make this happen. Pennsylvania Interfaith Power and Light is a group that um, is a faith-based group that responds to climate change. Esperanza, as I mentioned, is a nonprofit um, in Hunting Park, and then the city uh, kind of worked with them on it. Unfortunately, there were a lot of changes in both of those organizations, um, and so the city, being me, sort of had to take it on. So right now it's really just like me guiding it with all the other organizations in Hunting Park. Um, so that's what's happening now. We originally wanted to make something that was a network of faith-based institutions, businesses, community groups, and residents who could offer cooling spaces and resources during a high heat event, so a heat health emergency in Philadelphia, with all these different roles included. But because of COVID, we had to shift gears. Um, and the, the main part of this that, that lived on was the steering committee, which we have many residents part of, maybe four community organization representatives and me. Um, and we worked together to make decisions about the project. We did include heat ambassador. Um, and we do have two cooling centers that were able to be open. So kind of a breakdown of the strategy today. Like I said, we have the steering committee. Um, they guide the first level of implementation of the heat relief network steering committee, or sorry, the first level um, of the Beat the Heat Plan. Um, they make decisions. We meet weekly right now, but off summer months, we meet monthly. Um, and like I said, a lot of residents are included. Uh, we have two community cooling centers. So one is a community church and the other one is a nonprofit, which are both located in Honey Park. They open their doors during a high heat event for folks to come in and hang out, drink water, um, and it is socially distanced. So with that, it does not include things like movies, food, um, but we were able to open, open some doors for that. Then we have the heat ambassador, which is a compensated position. We actually have two, um, and they help distribute surveys and uh, direct the project in general. And then giveaways. So we have a lot of heat relieving resources we're giving away right now. Um, I actually have like 30 fans in my car right now um, that are being distributed and the steering committee really guides that. So any residents on the steering committee and we're constantly adding folks to the steering committee, it's an option through the survey to opt in to be a part of it. Um, also, I wanna mention, oh, I'll mention that in a second. Um, so fans are delivered to folks who are specifically identified by their neighbors who are in the steering committee. Um, and so that's how we do that and we deliver them to them so to make sure that we're prioritizing those who would most benefit. Um, and then we have the Drexel University heat mitigation project. So because of COVID-19, um, we were able to partner with a university who wanted to do a project, found some funding. It's, a, it's on one block, so it's a block level heat mitigation project. Um, and I have the little diagram there. It's basically shade structures, planters, and some level of water function um, to help make the, the block a little bit less hot. It employs 
residents to take part in the structure building, take down setup. Um, and so I think in that way, it's, it's, it's an equitable approach. And then we have the Beat the Heat Survey, which is continuing this summer. Um, it's distributed across many opportunities within the Heat Relief Network, which are mainly food distribution giveaways that were prompted by COVID-19. So we tried to leverage that opportunity. It is incentivized with giveaways and a chance to win a gift card. So certain ones that we know go to seniors, they are, in, they are offered AC units, fans, or the chance to win a gift card. And then um, things that aren't as targeted as that the, the gift card is mentioned on the flyer. Um, and we are continuing to, to give away those different resources right now. So making like a tangible approach. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's an incredible presentation and a ton of information to take in. Um, I know we got a few questions in the chat, so I'd just like to direct us over there for a minute. Um, and I also want to let people know, I realize we're at five on the dot. I think we can stay on of just a few minutes um, to have some discussion. Um, so feel free to get in touch, you know, if you have a question and you're dropping off, um, we're also happy to, to uh, send those questions along to Cheyenne after. Um, so I see we have a, a question about um, the process and lessons learned from, from uh, building trust with the community. And if you felt like these are effective tools that other communities could also apply um, when you're working with historically disinvested um, places within cities and communities. And um, Miles is asking about um, how did you mend the barriers? Oh, yeah. Oh, the barriers. Sorry, that was one of the questions I was supposed to, supposed to include. Um, yeah, so I actually have like a little notes about that. So first, yeah, the project is designed to be replicated elsewhere. So that's like the, the heat toolkit. And then with this stage of implementation happening this summer, we have yet to create like a deliverable. I mean, it's been insane. So um, with that, we'll also hopefully make something that, that outlines like what steps we took and how. Um, and I think they are replicable, like, but it's important, you know, to always remember like anything you do to create adaptation and resilience, like it's gotta be tailored. It's gotta be tailored down to the person, you know? Um, but I would say anything, anything done here is absolutely recordable, especially if you are able to partner with not only community orgs who have funding to help, but also residents who are there with you. Like I leverage so much from residents who I just kind of like hang out with. We go on a little walk, we talk with folks and it, it just helps when they're like, oh, I know you. Okay. Who are you? You know, and then it opens up the opportunity. Um, and then as for barriers, I had a note about it that I'm trying to find, but now I can't find it. Um, I would say the main barriers, obviously like one being the biggest would be COVID-19. So that was huge. <laughs> for everyone and everything and everywhere. Um, but with the project, initially it was so much about, I mean, community cohesion is a huge element of the, all the work. So imagine now they're telling us you can't be cohesive, you know, you can't touch, you can't be near each other. Um, so thankfully, like the project really was started when everyone got a little more comfortable with, okay, wear masks, wash your hands, use hand sanitizer. So it was a little bit easier to, to have certain events where we socially distance, um, we enforce masks. Um, but that was a huge barrier, obviously. And then I would say um, another is always funding. Um, funding is obviously difficult at any given time. And really the way that we found ways around it was getting grants. Um, however, I think you know one resident said it best to me when he shared that any external money Coming, this, these are his words, that when external money is running the projects, the, there will always be poverty. Um, so, you know, that says a lot. And I would think, I would say that going forward, we would love to make it so that there wasn't as it, much dependence on external money. Um, and then the last is that a community engagement takes a lot of time, as anyone who has ever done it would know. You have to be patient and you're working against the clock because climate change is not patient and it waits for no one and it affects everyone at any given time. Um, was that, okay, yeah, I think that was all the, the two questions that you said at that time. Yeah. We also have a question from Jeffrey and um, feel free to ask it yourself. I'll just read it from the chat otherwise. 
Um, he was wondering about the range of strategies you proposed, if you looked at them from a time and cost scale, to think about um, how some of them take on much longer or deeper processes, like you were talking about the, the whole history of the city is built into what we're seeing today um, versus other things which might be relatively solvable. Um, and if that was a way that you used to evaluate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say so. And I think that's why the He Relief Network became an obvious first stage of implementation. And it was because what that took was labor, so folks giving their time and effort, and um, networking. So that's quite easier than planting a thousand trees and waiting 10 years for them to give shade. So I think definitely that's kind of how time was factored in. In terms of cost, like I said, it, it's always going to, cost is always a barrier, um, at least for us with this right now. Um, and again, the heat relief network at its base, at its foundation, is supposed to be something that is not costly because it leverages resources that are already there where people already know that they're there. So I would say that's probably what stands out the most for, for a cost time analysis. Thanks. Um, I wanna open the floor if anyone else has a question, feel free to raise a hand or just unmute yourself. Um, I have a question if no one else does, which is, um, you know, sort of about the perspective that the city brings to it versus the perspective that residents bring to this plan because you work so closely together. And I'm really, I'm curious to hear about how um, both ideas of what the vulnerabilities are in the neighborhood changed over the course of the project from the perspective maybe of residents um, as well as the opportunities. So, you know, if people came to the project with certain ideas about what the project could be, and then they came up with other strategies, solutions, um, you know, visions through the, through the work, what those would have been. So, sorry, are you asking if, if like residents had input about different strategies to implement? Um, well, I think they, from what I understood, they had a lot of input, but I'm curious if they gave you their feedback on sort of what their preconceptions were about the project over and how that might have changed or evolved over the life of the project. Okay, sorry, sorry. I got, I was like reading the chat. Um, yeah, I would say that, um, I would say two things. So one being that from the work that was done in 2018, which I was not there, but I was there the summer after, um, I think a lot of folks were um, initially very understanding and, and understood, okay, this is about heat. Um, and the goal is to respond to heat um, on a neighborhood level. But I think one thing that people often didn't quite um, get because of all the past of cities coming in, trying to do what they wanted, uh, nonprofits coming in, trying to do what they wanted and not worrying about their residents was sort of like, okay, so what do I have to do for you was kind of the question that I, I often got. And I was like, oh, like nothing, <laughs> you know, I just like want to talk to you. Um, and if you want to get involved and figure out stuff together, great. Um, so that would be one thing like pre a preconceived notion was, was what, what do you get out of this? Um, and I would say really, there's not really anything that I personally get out of this besides like incredible involvement with folks and also like professional development. Um, and I just try to keep transparency always at the forefront there. So, um, sharing with people like, okay, this is, this is what this is about. So I try to do that before anyone even says anything so that I don't scare anyone away. Um, so I think I might even have like halted hearing about people's preconceived notions. And then another would be now, um, people, their preconceived notions sometimes get a little bit, um, confused because, they want the project to go a different direction. For instance, like I said, the Burns Recycling Plant, a lot of people want that to be um, fixed, right? And it's hard to be at the lead, quote unquote, of the project with the other organizations and say, well, I actually can't do anything about that right now. Um, and that's like, <laughs> you know, so I would say that makes things difficult and but it also helps me make new notions about the project and us plan for what we would do next 
That's great. Thank you so much for joining us um, in the middle of this hot and crazy summer um, and really challenging summer. So I think just a few words in closing. Um, I know Sebastian mentioned this at the beginning. We have tried to structure the sessions of this year around a theme, which is understanding um, or learning from vulnerabilities and risks in our communities. And so we are um, planning a series of sessions in October through the spring that will um, look at different climate risks to further explore these questions. So October, precipitation and stormwater flooding, uh, drought in December, and then wildfire and extreme storms in 2021. And I know we said this before, but we really are looking to grow the management group of this, of Kale, and we're a very open and flexible, um, but right now small body of people. So if that is something of interest, please um, send me an email and we will fold you into the discussions and, and um, upcoming sessions. Uh, Cheyenne, thank you again. This has been a really fantastic experience and, and I've learned so much about Philadelphia and about this project. Um, so on behalf of the whole group, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Yeah, thank you so much. It's obviously a pleasure and a privilege to be able to share about anything. And um, I wish that, you know, we all could learn more directly from, from residents because really they hold the key to everything. Um, and when I say residents, it's funny because obviously I live in Philly, I'm a resident too. Um, but you know, what I mean is folks who are not connected to some kind of nonprofit or city relationship. And um, I just think like the more you listen to people who don't have a stake in it, in terms of it being their job and in terms of it being their life, um, you just learn everything. You just learn everything. So thank you all. And thanks for your time. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, everyone look forward to seeing you in, uh, in a couple of months and we'll be in touch.